All right, so it looks like we have people starting to join. Um, I just want to say welcome to all of our panelists. So we're going to get this event started. Um, so we have plenty of time for our discussion and our question and answer session as well. So firstly, I want to say good morning and welcome to our liberal breakfast on digital skilling co-hosted by the All Day Party and Microsoft. Before I introduce our wonderful panel for this morning, I would like to remind everyone that you can ask questions throughout this event by using the Q&A function um, here on Zoom, or if you're joining us on our Facebook Live, you can post your questions directly in the comments section on the video. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our panel. Moderating our event this morning is Jennifer Baker, better known as Brussels Geek. Jennifer has been a journalist in print, radio, and television for 20 years and the last 10 plus years specializing in EU policy. She has worked across a wide range of media from editing a national daily paper in Malta to reporting on European affairs for Middle Eastern television and has a wealth of experience in navigating the political quagmire of the EU. Regularly listed as one of the top influencers in the EU bubble, Jennifer was awarded number one tech influencer 2019 by ZN, was listed by Politico as one of the top 20 women shaping Brussels in 2017, and was named by Only Olitica as one of the world's top 100 influencers on data security in 2016. She is also a GLG expert council member providing advice on EU policy and was an original member of the expert council of the Good Technology Collective. Jennifer regularly features as an EU expert on various radio and television broadcasts and has also written for some of the biggest names in media. Our first panelist is Kasper Klinge, is Microsoft's Vice President for European Government Affairs with responsibility for all of Microsoft's government affairs and public policy work across the continent. He serves on the senior leadership team of Microsoft's CELA Group. Prior to joining Microsoft, Casper most recently served as Denmark's and the world's first ambassador to the global tech industry. Previous posts include ambassador to Indonesia, to more or less, Papua New Guinea, and ASEAN from 2014 to 2017. Ambassador to the Republic of Cyprus, deputy head of NATO's provincial reconstruction team in Helmand province, Afghanistan, and head of mission of the EU civilian crisis management planning mission in Kosovo. Kasper holds an MSc in political science and is a 2009 Marshall Memorial Fellow. Next is Ms. Dita Cheranzova, who is the Vice President of the European Parliament from the Czech Republic and Vice President of the Alde Party. Elected in 2014, she is now serving her second mandate within the Liberal Group Renew Europe. Ms. Cheranzova completed a doctorate degree from the University of Economics Prague and graduated from the Diplomatic Academy in Madrid. She is a former diplomat where postings included the Czech permanent representation to the EU during the Czech presidency. In the European Parliament, Ms. Charanzova is the Renew Europe spokesperson for the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee and a substitute member in the International Trade Committee. Ms. Charanzova was named MEP of the Year in the field of foreign affairs in the 2016 MEP Awards. She was also among the 20 most influential women that are shaping Brussels politics in 2020, according to Politico. And last but not least, we have Ms. Abir Al-Sahlani, an MEP from the Renew Europe Group from Sweden since 2019. Ms. Al-Sahlani holds a master's degree from Stockholm University. In the parliament, she serves on the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs. In addition to her committee work, she is a member of the European Parliament Intergroup on Disability, the Intergroup on LGBT Rights, and the Intergroup on Seas, Rivers, Islands, and Coastal Areas. Before being elected to the European Parliament, Ms. Al-Sahlani, was a member of the Swedish parliament and also served as the secretary general of the Iraqi National Democratic Alliance in 2004. So welcome everyone. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you very much for those uh, introductions. Uh, notwithstanding the extremely impressive bios, I think we're gonna go with first name terms here today. So uh, the topic for this morning's discussion is the future of digital employment. Now, when I read this, I thought, of course, you know, we, we talk about this, we have talked about this, those of us in Brussels and in policy and tech areas for many, many years. But I think it's fair to say the future is now. So let me start by uh, handing straight over. Abir, give me your take on this overall topic and then we'll get into the details. And of course, reminding attendees that they can ask questions via the Q&A function. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. This is what I want to start off, and it's such a pleasure to be around uh, so competent and uh, exciting, interesting people. I'm really honored. Uh, I want to start off by saying that not only do we need to handle uh, this current crisis on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, handle the outcomes, try to predict what uh, the, uh, the impact of it on a daily basis, but also simultaneously as politicians, we need to look into the future and uh, try to uh, imagine and evaluate on how everyday life of tomorrow will look like for European citizens. Uh, as you know, with European institutions have put a lot of emphasis on digital policy during this mandate uh, of the European Parliament, and it is highly necessary, uh, if you ask me. Uh, the vision of a European society that is powered by di digital, digital solutions uh, is in need uh, a goal, and it is actually very desirable and important. But in order to get there, we need to conduct multiple structural investments because uh, it is um, uh, undoubtedly so that not the whole EU is actually well connected. It's not the whole EU that is actually digital. And we know that different ge geographic uh, areas of the EU are more or less left behind. And these investments have to be both politically and financially sound with a clear long-term objectives. That does not mean that we need a harmonized EU proposal for every societal change, but rather to increase coordination among member states and share best practices. Because also there is a tendency that we think by legislation and by having uh, one fix for all, then, then, we, then we can solve our problems. And as a member of the uh, EMPOL committee, the Committee on uh, Employment and Social Affairs, I strive to promote policies uh, that put emphasis on freedom of movement, a functioning single market, and efficient use of financial resources. I also try to be realistic in terms of what kind of output we can expect uh, on both political uh, on our political initiatives. From an employment and social perspective, we will never have the fully connected European workforce if access to digital infrastructure is limited to urban metropolitan regions. Uh, we will never have a digital uh, skilled workforce if around 50% of adults, of the adults within the EU lack basic di digital skills as of today. On top of that, uh, around the EU, uh, some 50 million adults have literacy difficulties and among the 15 years old, uh, we, we, the share is one to five. And why is this important in the context of future digital employment? Yeah, because it's ultimately people with literal uh, literacy difficulties that are more likely to find themselves selves in insecure employment. Uh, in addition, adults aged 16 to 65 with literacy difficulties are more likely to be unemployed and on social benefits. This uh, it creates a number of challenges for businesses to find flexible, skilled and educated workforce, but also uh, increases the need uh, for developers and companies like Microsoft to develop inclusive and efficient educational tools. With all of this in mind, I want to stress that I am optimistic, both of nature, but also because being a liberal, and that's both a, it is both a blessing and a, a curse. But I truly believe that um, in the power of free movement, free enterprise, and open markets. Okay, thank you, Tita. Good morning. Let me ask you um, how you interpret, if you like, even the topic of our debate today, just as an opening statement. What is the future of digital employment? And I said the future is now. Do you see that as being in, impactful or not? Indeed, Jennifer, and thank you for, for this invitation. I mean, 
uh, every crisis opens certain opportunity. And if there is any opportunity in this COVID pandemic, then it's the opportunity for us to embrace the digital transformation in Europe. If you just look at the figures, and it was even interesting for me to read it, in 2019, we had uh, slightly over 5% of those employed in the European Union that usually worked from home. Look, today it's more than 40% and even more, it depends, of course, on the field of your expertise. Not everything can go online and can uh, be done from home. But there are a lot of challenges ahead of us. Uh, uh, I'm very happy and I was very pleased that also the companies and we will soon uh, will have uh, one contribution in this regard helped us during the first uh, crisis of, uh, of the of the pandemia, that they facilitate the tools, that they made the tools for us available. There were a lot of contribution from the company sides that we basically turned our life, both uh, the work life, but sometimes also social life to online, which is very good and very welcome. On the other hand, what we can do as politicians, there is a lot that I see on our, our plate. One is, and I've been fighting for it for, for some years, to, to acknowledge the fact that internet must become a utility in the European Union. It's not just electricity and water, it's also internet. So we need to have a broadband um, infrastructure in, in the European Union, access uh, to, the Euro uh, to the internet everywhere. That's where we are trying to really speed up our process. The other issue, and Abir already mentioned it, is the digital divide in Europe, that where we have regions, countries that are lacking behind. There a lot is on the shoulders of the national governments. We adopted and we will update the digital skill agenda in the European Union. But we need the, the digital um, agenda to become the DNA for, for the young, the, uh, for the children, not only young people, but really starting uh, uh, in the school. So education is, is very important. So these are the, 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 the opportunities, both for the companies and us uh, politicians that we need, really need to embrace. Uh, and uh, let's take it as a lesson learned that there are possibilities how to switch our work online and we need to just to pave the way for it. Thank you. And um, Casper, now Microsoft has a huge background in this area. We talk a lot about digital and sometimes for people that means social digital or it means uh, just method of communication. But Microsoft is actually got the experience of creating new jobs in a, in a new way that didn't exist before. Can you tell me a bit about that and how that pertains to our topic today? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And, and also thanks to, to Abir and Dita for, for allowing me to be on the panel with you today. Um, actually, I, I wanted to use myself as an example on this because uh, I recently uh, joined uh, Microsoft on the 1st of March after having spent uh, um, a couple of decades in, in government. And I was in the office here in Brussels for, for two weeks. And then, of course, because of COVID-19, everything uh, closed down. We closed the office. Um, and then I was working together with the rest of my colleagues uh, from home for almost four months before returning to the office around the 1st of July. And, and, you know, we're among the privileged and lucky ones because we did have the digital infrastructure, we had, you know, the digital skills to actually to be able to continue work more or less on uh, disrupted uh, during those uh, initial uh, four months. But as both uh, Dita and Abir has mentioned, um, you know, one of the clear lessons that we learned from the first six months of COVID-19 is that, you know, it hits uh, unevenly. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, manual workers or even women have been uh, proportionally hit harder by, by unemployment, uh, not only in, in Europe, but across the world. And we know how important today that access to critical infrastructure and to digital skills and, and to basic uh, technology that, have, that has been in retaining sort of economic uh, levels of activities um, and also in maintaining, uh, maintaining jobs. Uh, you know, we're looking at perhaps 60 million uh, unemployed uh, people in Europe because of COVID-19. 
uh, I would argue that did we not have access to these 21st century technologies, that number might actually be a lot higher than it is today. So to some extent, I think we have to feel lucky and privileged that we do have Zoom or Teams, if you allow me to use a, a Microsoft technology. But I think we also have to really focus on, on, on the clear fact that this is hitting unevenly, even in, in, in Europe, and we have to make sure that we get everybody on board in, in the bus. And, you know, when we look at back, look back on, on the last week uh, here in, in Brussels, I, I want to highlight also the, uh, the speech by the European Commission President, the State of the European Union uh, speech, because I think, as far as I counted, she mentioned digital 19 times uh, during that speech. And there was a lot of focus also on the need of reskilling and upskilling uh, people to cope not only with uh, with COVID-19 but also to make sure that we have the digital skills uh, that will be needed for for the job market uh, of tomorrow. And we've also seen a sort of the launch of um, of a number of activities. Um, I, I perhaps I wanted to mention also the European Commission's Pact for Skills as a new initiative. And I think the the, the beautiful part of this is an acknowledgement that in the middle of a global pandemic, but also looking at the massive changes that technology and digitalization will bring. You know, it's really a joint effort to try and make sure that we respond in a proper way. Governments cannot do it alone. I speak as a former government official. Um, the private sector cannot do it alone. We have to make sure that we collaborate. And I think that's really where the Pact uh, for Skills uh, tries to make sure that we will bring together also the private sector and these efforts. And at Microsoft, we look forward to hopefully joining that uh, later in, in November. Um, as you alluded to, Jennifer, if you allow me just very quickly to say that I think that responsibility um, is something that we're feeling uh, very, very much on our own shoulders. And we did launch, and I can talk more about it later, uh, a fairly ambitious skilling uh, initiative a few months ago. We want to train 25 million people across, uh, across the world with new digital skills, you know, software developers, IT specialists, the, the kind of, uh, of skills that we know the private sector is looking for, we also know what, which is going to be important in, in recovering from, uh, from COVID-19. Um, in Western Europe, already now, we have trained more than 600,000 600, uh, people, but this is not the end of it. And we have to make sure that we respond to the demands of the, um, of, of the, of the private sector and governments as well. Uh, thank you for that. And I know you, you did mention the, the Commission's uh, most recent uh, sort of proposals. The thing is, no one could really disagree with those. But I remember several years ago hearing Neely Close talk about getting every European digital by 2020. And it doesn't really seem that that has actually happened. And I want to interrogate a little bit whether the EU as, as, as a bloc, as, as a political movement, can actually do anything when it does very often come down to these local and not even national, but regional questions. Because I think by every European digital, what was meant, and I'm going to hand this over to our MEP shortly, what was meant was simply just get everyone online. That's not really the same thing as get everyone online with the skills to work. Um, Abir, I see you shaking your head. Can you give me your reaction to that? And you know, if we've missed one target, how do we not miss future targets? Well, I just let me just begin because I'm I'm a computer system scientist and, and before being a politician, uh, and uh, I very much agree that um, that uh, getting everyone online is not being the same as as being digitally skilled. Uh, uh, digitally skilled is so much more also about being effective, knowing how to uh, have this. Um, um, what do you call it, um, you know, the advantage of merging several systems and using the effectiveness of that, uh, knowing how to plan and how to stick to a planning with digital tools. Uh, it's not only about being online and it's not only about, about being on Facebook or on Instagram. It's, it's so much more than that. I mean, um, even if one of the reasons I think is uh, a lot of, of the pressure on, on, on the EU has been uh, this kind of socialistic thinking that we need a social Europe. And uh, that has been interrupted, uh, uh, that has been translated as that we have to have a common welfare system rather than we have to actually strengthen our internal markets. We have to strengthen the worker workforce mobility. Uh, and uh, this description, uh, 
this, this difference between uh, what is possible to do with European level legislation and what the treaty is saying and what the actual outcome, because it is still so, it is a reality that we are living that different member states are developing in different pace. We are developing maybe not in different directions, but not as fast as everyone. And it will be very evident, and we will see that in, in just a couple of years now, uh, that how, peop how countries where you have already uh, uh, a high rate about, uh, uh, of educated people, but also a higher rate of e-governance, a higher rate of di digitally skilled people, uh, workforce, how they are going to outrun the other member states. And I think that um, the focus on social issues has been too far reaching, if you ask me. I don't want that people in different member states to be uh, not to be equal in rights or not to, to have to enjoy the same life or the same. I mean, I, I'm so much for pro equality, but I think that the at least when I say when I see it from my my position as a parliamentarian, there there is a misconception about how we can reach there. It is not with common legislation. It's not by uh, enforcing our committee, EMPL committee, uh, to, to dig into that, um, uh, that kind of legislations and try to uh, enforce uh, on, on, on countries different, for example, minimum wages and stuff like that, but rather about uh, exchanging um, uh, experiences, setting targets on national levels and uh, uh, supporting the national governments in achieving their goals. Um, I think it's, uh, it's pretty much this, from my point of view, when it comes to the EMPL committee. Sorry, DJ, can I ask you to pick up on this idea of different paces in, in different countries and what can be done at EU level? Do we want to level everybody up? I mean, obviously, we don't want the, the faster countries to slow down. So how do you how do you square that circle, as it were? And um, how do you try and get everyone up to a same advanced level when so many of the things we're talking about are actually member state competencies rather than something necessarily in the gift of the EU? Jennifer, you are absolutely right. The problems here, the problem here uh, are the competences between the member states and the European Union. Nevertheless, I think we have one common goal, which is, for instance, to create a digital single market. So we have a lot of uh, common projects together. And I, I will just continue on where Abir stopped. Uh, I mean, the fact that uh, uh, that you are born in digital age doesn't necessarily mean that you have the digital competences, that you have the digital skills. And we see it from a lot of studies over the European Union, that the young generation that uses the digital devices doesn't have enough digital skills. It's not the same, it's not the same. Uh, we see the, the divide, uh, well, I come from the Czech Republic, we score every year under the, average, under the EU average. Sweden, on the contrary, is one of the best. So where I see the added value is also to share the best practices that we learn from each other. Uh, of course, we need to have tailor-made national projects and programs. And then the qu question of money comes. No money, no funny. We have now the discussion about the new budget uh, and the parliament has been very vocal on the fact that we want more money on digital transformation, not only green transformation where over 30% of the spending will go. We want the same for, for, for the digital transformation because if we end up with, the, with what we see, the digital literacy, then we are creating problems for the future. So let's grasp uh, this opportunity and really invest. So for me, it's one to settle uh, good EU objectives, share the best practices and help the countries to develop them and give enough spending from the EU budget. This is the modern European Union. <laughs>
But just <laughs> let, as a follow up question, because I'm going to go to Casper next, is what role do you see for private enterprise, for business, for companies? You know, we talk about public private partnerships. You've, you've mentioned money. It always comes up in these questions. Where is the role for companies like Microsoft? Mm. Or what should be the role? As I said it during my first intervention, I think the companies, they, they understood very well at the beginning of this crisis that there is an opportunity for them, but also a certain responsibility. So I was very happy to see how many projects they opened, some of them free of charge. They, they helped us to use their devices free of charge. There are new and new applications. Look, I, in one day like today, I will be using four different applications for four different meetings. This is amazing. So we really need, as you said, the private-public partnership to develop further and we have to do it together because our common goal while well, the private uh, goal uh, the, the, the goal of the private companies is of course make profit but at the same time uh, if they want us to use their technologies we need to have uh, appropriate skills so I think uh, the, it's what we call win-win situation so uh, I very much hope that the companies will work together with us and we will um, be able to develop further projects to the, together okay Casper I suspect that must be music to your ears um, let me ask you this you, you mentioned uh, you, that your your skilling initiative is going to reach out to a hopeful 25 million people that is a huge number of people. I mean, do we run the risk that, that companies are teaching people rather than our education uh, ministries and our, our educational boards in national areas? And is that how you think the future should go? I mean, we talk about public-private partnerships, but is that something that you think should happen in education, which is, of course, a very sensitive area and, and key to the future of uh, digital employment, which we're talking about today? Yeah, listen, a super good question. And I, I think I would completely agree with what Dietz and Abir said before. You know, when we're not looking at replacing traditional educational systems uh, in no way, but I, I think, you know, we are perhaps in an unprecedented situation because of COVID-19 and the impact is is enormous uh, with a lot of inequalities uh, across even Europe or certainly across the world. And I think in that situation is just all hands on deck. And, and when you do represent a, a big technology company that has, uh, you know, been among the industries that have done well during, uh, during COVID-19, I think we have a fundamental responsibility to try and chip in. Will our efforts fix everything? Absolutely, absolutely not. But if we can help sort of recover the economies, you know, trying to get those who lost their jobs during COVID-19 back into the workforce, I think that's a helpful uh, contribution. I, I, perhaps I, I should mention what our initiative is, is about because it's not only, um, you know, making some of these courses available on LinkedIn or GitHub or on, on Microsoft Learn. It's actually also providing certification for those that will go through these courses. And I think that's an important element where there is a very important national and, and I think also European, uh, European Union level um, aspect, which is to make sure that these certifications will be recognized in the traditional educational systems. It goes without saying that if you go, if you take a course, you know, if you want to be, um, you don't want to be the premier influence in Europe, but you want to become a software developer. Let's just think about that. Um, and you get a certificate of, of on the background of a, of a course, and that is not recognized by you know other companies or employers in in the public space. Uh, that's a massive problem. So what we're trying to do is also in national uh, headquarters in um, in capitals try and work on how we make sure that our certification will be recognized as well. But there's another element of what we're trying to do, which I think is super important, and that is making data and analytics available to governments across Europe, because I think one of the challenges we all stand in is to you know you cannot fix the problem before you understand the problem and i think we need to make sure we have data available so we understand who has lost their jobs what are the kind of skills that are in demand by the private sector or by the public sector and and those are the kind of of, of data analytics we are making available again free of charge you know because i was on a, on a panel with Dietz and Abir, i was just looking at the numbers we have for the czech republic and, and for sweden and when we look, you know, five years into the future, our estimation is that it's actually interesting. Both countries have almost the same uh, numbers, but we're looking at perhaps 370,000, 380,000 jobs in the technology industry uh, that will be in demand. And that's a lot of jobs, uh, I think, in, in, even in countries like the Czech Republic and, and Sweden. And if we can help together with governments 
uh, make those skills uh, available, uh, not least in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I think I think that's an important uh, contribution uh, to a uh, you know a very very difficult situation. And if you allow me, Jennifer, I, you know I had a conversation with one of my colleagues coming into the office this morning. Um, you know, a, a younger colleague than, than me, unfortunately, I cannot hide that. Um, and he said, you know, a lot of his friends are just graduating from universities or from educations, and they're standing in, you know, in a big abyss right now. It's very difficult for them to get access to, to jobs, uh, perhaps because they don't have the right skill sets. And we shouldn't forget that unemployment among people below 25 is, is much, much greater than it is uh, as, a, as a general point across Europe. So I think we need to focus also on, on youth. In, in making sure that we give them the, the skills uh, that will be in, in demand uh, in the next couple of years. And I think that's a responsibility that uh, lies in the private sector as well as the, the public sector at the same time. Casper, uh, I'm gonna go straight very quickly to a, a follow-up question that's been put by David Randall. He's asking, what's the best way to access data on lost jobs and skill gaps, skills gaps if you're in the UK? If, uh, if, it's a, if that's a quick answer you have, if there's, a, if there's a website or something you can direct them to, that would be useful. Yeah, I mean, we'd be very happy also to share this in, in the chat, sort of the direct links. But but I would I would recommend going on on LinkedIn, uh, where there is a whole set of um, of different uh, statistics. Uh, you can zoom in on your individual country. You can you can look at at the data available, uh, both the data in terms of what courses are available free of charge, but you can also look at what skills we think we believe will be in demand over the next couple of years. So hopefully that's a, that's a useful tool. If you cannot find it, hunt me down and I'll be, uh, I'll be very happy to make sure you get the, uh, uh, the right links for that. Okay, thank you for that. Now we also have a question coming in from our Facebook stream. Hello to everyone who's watching there online. Uh, it's a question to Abir. If we apply the subsidiarity principle, what national structures could we dismantle and what federal structures could be strengthened? in order to achieve European-wide digitalization? Well, let me just say that uh, as a politician, we don't say, hunt me down. <laughs> this is like a nightmare. No, uh, but thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being so willing to share. Uh, well, uh, I think that is, uh, it is very vital that our the member states realize that by uh, empowering their populations dig digitally, uh, then they are empowering their own societies. And uh, we see now how, uh, how also countries with higher level of uh, digitally skilled uh, populations, but also companies, enterprises that are more digital are also bouncing back faster from the current crisis. So this should be actually an ultimate proof of how important that the member state on a national level make this work. And it is about priorities. Um, member states have to understand that promoting innovation and uh, technological development is prerequisite uh, for a good quality life for their citizens. And uh, I mean, we have now uh, a, a European uh, digital uh, skills agenda uh, that has been launched, and, and this is positive, but it is all about the implementation. And we have a lot of good um, uh, strategies in the EU. Also, there are some money put into it. I mean, it doesn't come just with words, it's not only papers, but it is about making the choice to implement it and implement it for, for, for a long-term perspective and not only for now. Uh, so, um, I think I'm sure that uh, I mean, social partners, tech companies, and other have a have have a role to play here. Uh, but uh, I think it is it is all. I mean, ultimately, uh, in the end of the day, it is how politicians on the national level choose to either make it a priority or not. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but. Uh, um, uh, I think that it, we are shooting ourselves in the foot, as we say in, in, in Swedish, in Sweden, uh, if, um, if we take away uh, this responsibility from the national level. And uh, because education is still a national 
competence, uh, social affairs and social welfare is still a national competence. I think uh, it is very important to, um, to actually, um, as I said earlier, uh, best practices sharing, having setting goals, national, uh, national uh, uh, recommendations for each country. Uh, there is a lot of help to get actually from the European Union, but it is the footwork has to be done by the national governments. Dita, I wanted to pick up on a comment you made in, in one of your earlier, in the earlier interventions, which was the idea of the internet as a utility. I mean, as a sort of backbone, as a, as a public service. Can you expand a bit on that? Because it seems a great idea, but we know that in practice, there's going to be a lot of <laughs> issues to be ironed out. Well, uh, yes and no, because we had already did this discussion before. Uh, it is basically now in the European law that uh, uh, internet is as a utility and there must be an access to it. Um, we, of course, then can discuss what quality of internet everybody will have. That's yet another story. But it's now up to the government that agreed all of them to it to, to translate it into reality because we are living in the digital age and we all agreed on it. And of course, if you don't have uh, affordable uh, broadband uh, internet, you, 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 cannot, you cannot live in this century. And uh, the, the, the COVID crisis uh, is a good example that we might have a situation where the only tool how to communicate with the entire world will be the internet. So that's already in our legislation. It's now that we need to develop it further, that we have to also develop further uh, the 5G, for instance, in Europe. So when I travel from Brussels to Strasbourg, I can use the internet and um, not to experience what uh, everybody experiences that today, that there is a big difference between Belgium, Luxembourg and France. So, um, which leads me also a little bit follow up on what uh, Abir mentioned on this national competences. I fully agree. Uh, I think uh, we need to um, support the national governments in their way, how they will tailor marry they are projects uh, in digit for digital transformation. But what I wanted to add is that I'm happy to see that there is a lot of also of cross-regional initiatives between the member states. Um, there was a new project between Estonia, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Latvia, Lithuania, Norway, Sweden, because they pulled their solution on uh, how to share uh, digital educational tools. So it's not just uh, a problem of one, uh, I would say, a country. It can also be um, the, the way forward can be also in certain regional cooperation. We have countries like Estonia, where we all always look, especially when we do the tax revenues. And I, I always admire the fact that my colleagues, they receive in their in their mobile devices, their tax revenue, and they just click and in three minutes they, they submit the tax revenues. I wish to have the same in my country and I wish to have the same for everybody in the European Union. So uh, the, the, the beauty here, I think, is that we have some countries that are far, for, that they have developed already uh, their, their, their systems and uh, it's now up to us how we will take the advantage and learn the, the best practices from them. Thank you. Well, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was how the tech sector could create new jobs. Uh, and Casper, I want to ask you, before we come on to who's going to get those jobs, let me first ask, what are those jobs? Is it a matter of using digital skills to do jobs that you know pre-exist or is it a matter of these new jobs is it are we all look are we all going to be coders now that's i guess what i'm trying to ask you yeah no i don't think we will all be coders and for some for some of us that's a relief because i think not all of us would be great coders um but but i, I think the point here is that you know we already had a sense of urgency uh, you know a year ago that because of the fast pace of technology development 
the skills requirement is 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 out there. It was out there before COVID nineteen, but as many others have said, you know, we saw a massive acceleration of digitalization during COVID nineteen. Um, you know, my boss Satya Nadella said that we probably saw two years of digitalization taking place in just two months. Um, I think, unfortunately, we probably saw a couple of years of economic growth then disappear at the same time. But, but I think that sense of urgency is something we shouldn't uh, lose uh, lose sight of. And, and what we're saying is not that everybody uh, should, you know, acquire these digital skills. But what we have seen, and and I think, you know, both up here and and, and Dietza has confirmed this that. You know, when you look at the people who unfortunately became unemployed uh, and were likely not at the end of this, uh, unfortunately, as we all realize, you know, proportionally, we had more people from traditional manual labor. Uh, we had people from, from industries that perhaps were less digitalized. We had a massive difference uh, across Europe. And in general, when you look at the DAISY index, you know, in general, those countries that were more digitalized uh, fared a little bit better during COVID-19 than those who were less digitalized. And again, I think that requires us to really focus on making sure that we handle those many million people that have lost their jobs and try and give them skill sets that are in demand uh, for the future. And, and I mentioned a couple of before, sort of software developers, IT specialists, graphic designers. And, and these are not, uh, you know, let me be honest, sort of four or five year courses, of course. It's something where you can add to existing education. You can make yourself available for those uh, companies or those uh, you know governments that are looking for people with that specific skill set, I also want to say you know if I bring I hope I'm not distorting the discussion too much, but I also want to add that I think one of the flip sides of the coins in terms of the digitalization we've seen is of course also vulnerabilities in terms of cyber attacks uh, from from the outside. So I think also in this regard we have to make sure we really upgrade uh, skills of people working on IT, but also those of us that perhaps are not program as ourselves so that we also build up resilience against the threat that unfortunately comes with, with increased the digitalization across Europe. So, so our assessment is that in a number of specific areas, there is a high demand. Uh, there is a high demand right now. That demand will not disappear over the next couple of years. And, and we have to make sure we work with governments in, in trying to create a joint uh, educational system that uh, brings about those skill sets for people. Abir and Dita, I want to come to you about this question of, we talk about the digital gap, um, and it seems to me that it's not just a digital gap that equally affects everyone equally across the EU, that it almost also reflects a representation gap in terms of race and gender, and a poverty gap in terms of uh, what skills you've got from your background. So I think with a rush to digitization, what I'm asking is to, to play devil's advocate, do we run the risk of creating a two-tier society? Those who have the skills and can use digital and those who are left behind. Um, and obviously that's not something that I, I'm gonna suggest that we want. And if so, how do we get around that? If you can't create the technology, if you're not the coder, how can you get be really represented in terms of its use? Abir, I'm gonna to go to you first. It's, it's a bit of a complex issue, but you know, I mean, you think of a typical coder, we all know who we think of when, when we think of that. And, you know, how do we change that? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting question uh, because it touches upon both ethical, but also political ideological perspectives. Um, uh, I just want to uh, uh, reflect upon what, what background I come from. Uh, I come from a Scandinavian country where you have um, social dialogue for 200 years that is not politically affected. The political parties, the national governments through these years, uh, they have not been actively participating in setting wages and setting working conditions for each sector, but rather the social partners has been those who negotiated with each other, so the employer side and the employee's side, the workforce, they have been uh, discussing together uh, what kind of conditions, what kind of, of, of uh, wage levels they, they, put, or they put. And that actually is, is a very liberal and democratic way of, uh, of managing your labor market because the two parties, the two parts of the labor market are negotiating directly without any political involvement. So that means that 
our labor market have been developing in Sweden uh, on a dynamic organic base uh, without having this ideological interference with like social democrats or leftists or liberals or conservatives uh, trying to affect the development of the, the labor market. Of course, I cannot demand this from 27 member states. And of course, not everyone sees the beauty of this. Uh, I understand that. Uh, you have to be maybe uh, from the northern part of Europe. But uh, uh, I think that trying to go that way, uh, having the labor unions and the employer side discussing and setting up the uh, conditions for the labor market is, is is ensuring an inclusive process uh, because we know that uh, political parties are representing themselves and their ideologies and their programs for, for the government. And while maybe unions and employers organizations, uh, they represent um, the members of those organizations. And that is far more inclusive and reflecting society's complexion than political parties, unfortunately. Uh, we, uh, as political party, I know uh, that we uh, work for our members uh, and uh, all political parties cannot say that we reflect the whole society, but we reflect the sector of society. While organizations that are uh, horizontal more, uh, they are more likely to represent the interest of both the one who is skilled and not skilled because everyone in the labor union or in the employers union are there on the same uh, um, on the same merits and that's why i i i mean i am more of a supporter of of the nash of the social partners dialogue and in that way ensure their uh, inclusivity to be more uh, reflecting the the, the uh, complexion of societies and the, the different uh, the the different levels of digital skilling and uh, i mean it is of course that um, um, it is a difficult thing to to argue for in the european parliament where we have so different um, different approach to labor market well, and, and you know, let's let's take uh, from the Czech point of view, Dita. I mean, does this uh, so-called digital gap reflect other gaps in representation, be it race, gender, education? And if so, how do we how do we tackle that, and how do we work towards increased digitization without letting one part of society run away miles ahead of the rest? That's definitely the, the challenge ahead of us. And uh, I mean, we've been encouraging, for instance, female participation in the IT sectors um, a lot. Uh, but you need to also have a good examples. You need to have good projects. I, I'm very proud uh, that in the Czech Republic, there is a very good project called Czechitas, which is slowly... Uh, developing also to other European countries, which is basically a project focusing on, on mothers, uh, on maternity leaves. So when you want to really start something, but at the same time, keep the good uh, balance between your family life and your future career. So they prepared a number of uh, e-learning uh, projects for, for, for women that are on maternity leave so they can uh, start completely new ca career being it de developing the websites etc so and these are the model examples that we have to also export to sorry, export to to to, to uh, uh, other countries there, there is a big difference between the member states. We've already mentioned it. I mean, there is a also big difference uh, when it comes to the average household income spent on mobile uh, broadband coverage in Europe, which is also a, fir a first problem. I have um, uh, argued a lot in my country, in the Czech Republic, and supported the initiative to, to have the digital agenda already in the elementary school. That people, that children, once entering the school, it will become the, the, the part of the basic education. 
And that's what we have to convince some traditional approach to education in, in some countries. So for me, I would really start with, with the early age and to develop and start um, uh, de to develop the, the, the digital skills already from the elementary school. Casper, I suspect your answer may reflect some of what Dita is saying there in terms of education from a young age. Uh, but my question to you is not so much about a representation gap and more about this idea that uh, we may create a two-tier society of those who make the tools, these digital tools, and those who use them. Uh, because, because when you're responsible for creating something, you have a lot more input into how it should work. You have a lot more input into those sort of unconscious biases that we all have. How do you get everyone to be not just a user, but a creator? And is that even what, what we should be seeking to do as a European society? Yeah, th thanks for that question, Jennifer. And it actually goes back to something I, I tried to say in the beginning, but I don't think I, I, I was able to say it uh, as clear as I wanted. And that is, I think, you know, for those of us, uh, those companies that are delivering some of the critical infrastructure today, some of the you know, key pieces of technology we use to communicate, to educate, uh, the healthcare sector is, is really dependent on a lot of these tools today. I think we have enormous responsibility. We have responsibility for helping upskill people, but I think we also have responsibility for making sure that our technologies are without bias, that it respects uh, human rights, that it uh, doesn't have a gender bias. In other words, privacy issues, safety issues in general. I think those aspects of technologies are more important today than they were even seven, eight months ago. And I think that's a responsibility that, that no technology company can run away from. So I think if we look at it a bit internally, on top of you know having uh, I think important skilling announcements, wanting to help uh, educate, reskill, upskill uh, people, we also have to make sure that when we roll out teams or when we put in motion our artificial intelligence or machine learning technologies, that that really really represents that sort of the cutting edge in, uh, in in technology and that it lives up to the highest European values and the highest European standards, and and that's something you know I. You know, very happy to join a company where I actually think that's uh, at the top of the agenda, something that I've been confirmed with over the, the first six months here. And so, so a little bit of response to that. What I would also say, Jennifer, is that I don't think we should, um, and it's very difficult to talk about anything positive coming out of COVID-19, but the fact that we have this, this discussion today, the fact that Abir and, and Dita is super focused on, on skilling, on education, I think that's really an opportunity for us to put this even more on, on also on the political agenda. And I think that's where we shouldn't let the crisis go to waste. I think we can we can really uh, foster a, a new set of, of collaborations, but we also have to make sure we invest in uh, in skilling. And we also have to make sure we invest as both of you and Disa said, in, in things like access to internet, broadband uh, connections. Um, we still have way too many people that are outside um, you know, the circle and we know now more than ever before that not having access to uh, to technologies, not having access to the internet, is actually an incredibly uh, limiting uh, effect. And not least in a in a hybrid economy where where we are going to continue a bit like this uh, over the next couple of months, I'm sure. So so I think it's also an opportunity really to make sure at the European level, but also at the national level, inside technology companies, that we take this uh, challenge quite seriously. Uh, you've almost uh, you've almost preempted my last question there, Casper, which is Sorry about really, that. because <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask is, is really sort of as, as a final wrap up from you all is, is work from home the future? And if so, um, what does that mean? What are the pitfalls? What are what are the opportunities? And uh, Casper, I'm going to I'm asking you to expand since since, uh, since I have you there with your unmuted microphone. Um, is work from home the future? And if it is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Listen, I think it's very difficult to predict how the world is going to look in one year or in two years time. And um, and I know that we're all looking for answers. I think we're all struggling. Uh, I'm certainly struggling. I think my family is struggling uh, during these uh, times. And I think there is no question that working from home uh, or a hybrid model uh, will, will be necessary for quite some time. I also want to say, and don't tell anybody of the people that I work for now, that I don't hope that this will be you know, the model uh, for forever. I think you know, I cert I'm certainly a person who gets a lot of energy by being together with other people in a physical room. So I think once we have, you know, hopefully as soon a vaccine, hopefully soon better ways of treating COVID-19, that we'll gradually move into a more normal way of working together. Now, I do want to say, I think flexibility is something that will remain with us. I do think that 
uh, especially in the next generation, will expect uh, all of us as employees to be employers to be more flexible, allowing people, perhaps not every day, but from time to time, working from uh, from home. And I think actually, when we look at inside the inside the company that I work for now, it's it's actually remarkable how easy it's been to to transition a lot of the work uh, online. And I think that will will stay with us for some time. But I don't belong to the to the group of people who say that we will never sort of return to a tradi traditional way of working. I think it'll be a hybrid model with a lot more flexibility, but I also think people are desperately looking forward to the day when we can uh, be together and give each other a hug and, and actually have a conversation over a cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, Dieter, sort of same sort of point to you just to reflect on finally is you know, we talk about work from home is the future but obviously for a huge part of society it's not even an option so is it the future and is that good or bad or is it somewhere in between i think definitely more and more uh, jobs uh, or work i mean a lot of companies will try to uh, take a lesson from this period and see how to optimize uh, the, the working methods. So I think definitely, and I, I agree with Casper that there might be a kind of hybrid model, but it, the, this, uh, this crisis will definitely change due to the way how we work. And I have been also brainstorming how much it can change perhaps also the way of uh, how, how we do politics. Because, you know, as a member of the European Parliament, we travel a lot between Strasbourg, Brussels, our capitals. So I'm the one arguing that maybe we can really brainstorm for, for the, in the future whether some of our meetings can be done online so we can spend more time with our electorates with, uh, with the citizens maybe voting can be done online so i think that there is really an opportunity definitely it's not about one size fits all uh, there will be differences i cannot imagine certain uh, certain uh, professions going uh, online but uh, generally i think there will be a push to to learn from from this uh, from this crisis and adjust our working methods. Finally, then, Abir, uh, your sort of closing thoughts on this issue. I mean, the topic today was about the future of digital employment. Do you see that as meaning just lots of people working from home, or do you see that as a whole new industry with new jobs created that weren't there before? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, it, it is creating already new emerging companies who, who help you uh, work from home. And I think that uh, there will be new kinds of jobs new that we have not thought of yet. But uh, I think that the good uh, uh, entrepreneurs will come up with new solutions for us. It is very interesting, though, to see how for me, I, got, I, I had a baby on in the end of December and I was not supposed to be back at work until like four or, or five months after because no. in the European Parliament, we are not allowed to be on parental leave. But actually this crisis made it possible for me to get to bounce back to work, having a baby, but also being able to participate and fulfill uh, the task that I have been given by my electorate and also being able to raise a kid and being a politician. So I think the, 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 this digital transformation that we're going through when it comes to doing politics will give opportun new opportunities and also be more uh, uh, maybe uh, gender friendly for, for those who want to also have a, a family. Uh, as, as well as being politician. And of course, it makes me question why do we, or it continues to make me uh, question, why do we need to travel to Strasbourg with all the environmental costs and all the economical costs? And um, exactly as Dita also said earlier, it makes you question, why do I need to travel to be traveling every week like with the way we are doing? We are actually having a, a higher turn up of MEPs 
to our voting than we did when we had to go to Strasbourg and vote every uh, one time every month. So, I mean, it also has been more politically effective to be able to use digital platforms to, to perform our uh, duty as, uh, elect, uh, as elected officials. So I truly look forward to this, uh, this development and I hope that we can from the EMPOL committee be a part of, of, uh, um, of this uh, development where we encourage uh, uh, mobility of workforce, where we can encourage a sustainable and uh, even stronger internal market. And of course, looking forward how the tech companies can, um, uh, uh, we say in a Swedish, uh, you know, uh, grab arms with the educational sector and provide us with the new ways of learning and more inclusive ways of learning. Okay, thank you very much. It's been a very wide ranging discussion. We've, we've gone from everything about skills and education to, uh, to discussing the Strasbourg single seat question, which is possibly something we should always have expected would come up. I'm sure Casper representing Microsoft is glad that he doesn't have to get involved in that debate. But Amir and Dita, you obviously do. And thank you very much to all three of you for your attendance here today. Thank you for the attendees uh, for joining us. I'm gonna hand back now to Natalie to say a final few words uh, from the Aldi group and the new group and on what's, uh, what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you to Kashper, Dita, and Abir for your time this morning and for your insights. This is obviously an incredibly important, but also wide ranging topic. And especially I think moving forward out of this crisis, we need these types of discussions, especially between the public and private sector, because it's going to change um, our lives and how we you know, work, especially in how we interact with one another. So this was incredibly uh, important and insightful discussion. So thank you to to um, all of our panelists and our moderator. And thank you all for joining. Um, if you are interested in being kept up to date on all future liberal breakfasts and future events that the All Day Party has, um, please visit our website. Um, also, you can follow us on social media. We post regularly uh, about all of our event updates. We have some very exciting things coming up, especially in November and December, so you don't want to miss it. So once again, thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you to all of you who tuned in. I hope you have a great morning and an even better rest of your week.